Good evening, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, as Martijn said, we're currently here in Amsterdam. Uh, we are co-located in two spaces right now. There is a reception happening across the way, so a lot of you are watching on a big screen over there, hello. And uh, we also have some people here in the room, uh, as well as the rest of you around the world. Now, for those of you at the reception, uh, please applaud extra hard so we can hear it in this room. It's going to be a little bit quiet otherwise. And we do have three great industry talks lined up for you tonight. So I think there'll be plenty of reason to applaud. Our first speaker today is Alex Egg, And he will be telling us about online learning for recommendations at Grubhub. Please take it away, Alex. Yeah, thanks for the great introduction and what a, a great first day of the conference. It's a, a pleasure, a privilege to be in the company of so many um, researchers that I uh, admire and respect. So um, to get it started, a quick introduction about what Grubhub is. It's a marketplace that connects diners and restaurants and has a really uh, popular delivery component, which allows you to get your favorite eats anywhere, anytime. Um, the app has kind of four main properties the, from left to right. The, front page, search page, menu page, and then your kind of profile page. For today's talk, we're going to focus on the first page, and we feature recommendations across all these properties. Um, but let's look at this first page, which is a list of restaurant recommendations. Um, we deployed a new fancy um, recommender system this year, um, but we already shared those details at this year's um, GTC, NVIDIA GTC conference, so check that out if you want to learn more about that. Um, but just for background, it's this classic kind of two-stage information retrieval system where we have a um, uh, candidate selection stage, which gets a high recall set that's filtered, then ranked, and then calibrated. If you look at this diagram here on the left, it's a, a picture of what the app looks like and how we learn. So um, for a given context, like Friday at lunchtime and on Android device in Brooklyn, with my profile logged in, I'll click on the third impression, which is just salad, which gives a signal that in the future for the same given context, I might want to rank the salad above the burgers and the bagels. So if you can't tell already, this is some type of learning to rank objective on bandit feedback. And one more quick background on this before we get into the topic. Um, we have um, multiple features for users and items. They're all categorical, sparse, and variable length lists. Um, embeddings have vocab maps. And we have this nice contextual prior to help us with low information settings. And they're asymmetric. We don't model users directly. And at the bottom, we have a ranking network, which is a DCN. We saw Mr. Steck's talk earlier today, which spoke about the importance of higher order interactions. And hopefully, um, our embeddings are high enough to mention for him. Um, so we rolled out this new policy, like I said, and we got some interesting results. You can see here, uh, we, don't, um, we have the, this rapidly decaying kind of um, purchase through rate here, which is like our order conversion rate. Um, why, why would that happen? You know, we're all um, recommender system practitioners here. We've rolled out policies. Uh, wh what would cause this to happen? I think an astute observer of these systems would argue that this is the result of um, you know, these static embedding maps. For example, new users, new items come aboard, and we can't pick them up. Uh, but as you remember, I mentioned we have these asymmetric embeddings, and we have these contextual priors that help with that situation. Um, let's consider another hypothesis. What about drift? So here's a quick way to test if you have drift in your system. Um, make a training set, which is you know, some time period long, and make a bunch of test sets that are skewed. So if you see an inverse correlation between the age of your train set and your metrics, you're experiencing drift in your system more than likely. And Grubhub is a very complex, dynamic uh, marketplace um, with lots of stakeholders, diners, restaurants, um, drivers. Um, government regulation, acts of God, and through all of these interventions and, and conspiring forces, um, we get drift in our system. What's a quick fix for this? I think retraining is pretty reasonable. So here's a quick way to do retraining. Um, you could take a fixed width training set. Imagine here in this situation, we have daily partitions of data that come in, and we found that we can get to convergence with four days. We simply make this sliding window um, where we have on the y-axis, we have different rounds of training. So over three rounds of training, we shift the window over once each time. And this works pretty okay in practice. You can see that familiar blue line with the decay without retraining, and then the red line is with the weekly cadence of retraining. You can see the respective um, decay and recovery. And this also works pretty well for um, daily um, retraining too. However, um, this doesn't come free. Um, there's costs that are incurred by this method. 
Um, it's expensive. You'll notice that we have six unique days of data, Monday through Saturday. However, across the three rounds of training, we're actually training across 12 days. So you kind of have this redundancy factor of two. So in, in practice, this is expensive in terms of time. As you as a practitioner, you're wasting time training over days redundantly, and you're also spending a lot of money. Um, if, you're like, if you're a medium-sized company like Grubhub, for example, and you're probably on the public cloud, um, you're going to be burning a lot of GPU hours on this. Um, even if you have a private cloud, um, you're still locking up resources that could be used for better, um, better, better resources. So how can we um, fix this problem, right? We, 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 we experienced this drift problem. We introduced this kind of stateless full battery training to fix it. Um, we noticed it's quite expensive. Um, how can we fix that? Let's try and exploit the redundancy in the data and add state. So here's that previous diagram annotated with some Greek symbols, alpha, beta, gamma, that are used to highlight that these three rounds of training are independent models. They're stateless. Now let's consider this. You'll notice that this same diagram here has this alpha, but you'll notice it has a subscript, one, two, three. Um, that means that each model is simply another version of it. So what you could do instead of training across all the um, four days each round, why don't you just train on the new data? Serialize the model to disk. On round two, deserialize the model from disk, update, serialize to disk, update, serialize to disk again. So that's a nice, easy way um, to train incrementally, but that comes with two problems, right? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty on this new approach. On the first round, the model's only seen one day of data. While on this old approach, the model's seen four days of data. You don't want to deploy a very uncertain model. The other problem is, how do you even update incrementally? Um, that's a discussion about what kind of model architects you have. Are you using a decision tree? or using some type of gradient approach. Um, th each of those have different discussions about how they could be updated incrementally, which is in the paper. But we have to overcome those issues. Um, for this approach, you'll remember I'm using some type of a deep network, which implies some type of a gradient optimization, which we can do iteratively. Um, but now let's talk about how to fix this uncertainty problem. And, and, what, and just a quick note here that I skipped. Um, this is a lot cheaper, right? Um, instead of training on four days each round, we're training on one day. So that's a four times cost savings. So let's talk about how we fix this uncertainty problem. There's, we're essentially updating online now, right? So this is on, on policy learning. So how do we fix that? There's techniques in reinforcement literature that help us to do off policy evaluation. So let's take a look how we can do that. I think there's an interesting um, analogy we can make here. Um, hear me out. So we can simply take our, we have this log data offline that we're learning from previously with supervision. Um, why don't we just keep doing that? In the first round here, train our model to converge just offline with that log data we already have, deploy that model, then in round two, fine tune it on the new partition, then round three, take the fine tune model, fine tune it again on the new partition of data. So like, there's an interesting analogy here between um, um, fine tuning and domain application from the other domains that we work with a lot. So in vision models, there's some type of uh, inception or resonant that's trained on ImageNet, and you can fine-tune it to fit your, for example, Grubhub food images domain. Um, with, a, with a language model like BERT, for example, which is trained on Wikipedia and other book data sets, we could fine-tune it and adapt it to the Grubhub, for example, menu text domain. And I think there's an interesting analogy here between um, learning on the log data and then fine-tuning it on the new partitions to adapt for Drift. Um, and I like to approach this with this kind of domain adaptation approach. So to summarize, um, we, it's, we experienced drift. We observed drift in our system. We fixed that by the state, stateless retraining technique. We noticed it's very expensive. Um, we fixed that with this incremental training. And we, fixed, we also added um, uh, caveats that we need some type of architecture that can be updated incrementally. Um, and we also noticed that there is an uncertainty problem. And we fixed that with this kind of off-policy um, and pre-training and fine-tuning technique. But there's one little, another caveat here. So we're doing this these updates incrementally, on each round, these models are not new anymore. Um, they've already been tested. They've already seen data. Why are we still doing this classic cross-validation approach? And that leads to a discussion about considering something called progressive validation. We're no longer um, deploying on tested models. We're no longer stateless. We're stateful. Let's embrace state and update progressively. And that practically means um, get, getting rid of the classic cross-validation test set and just updating on the newest partition. And that allows our models to update faster response and get um, the drift even more under control. And that's a technique called progressive validation. 
One last problem with this setup. Um, you, you remember in the beginning we talked about these um, embeddings and how they have these static maps between the item and the embedding table. Um, that's not going to work in this case, right? So when we fine trained our model, uh, when we pre trained our model into co convergence offline, um, we had a fixed set of embeddings at that moment. So what happens when new restaurants leave or restaurants come on board or items or whatever your domain is? How do you handle that when you have these um, vocab maps? So a simple fix for that is to move to a different domain of encoding. So instead of a static map, think about a hash map. Um, that's an interesting technique we can use to um, scale our um, embeddings um, essentially to no limit. There's an interesting um, analysis we did here where we measure the co collision rate between the um, hash and the number of buckets in our table. And as you can see, as we scale to about 4 million um, items in our embedding table, the collision rate goes down to about 7%. And you can get that down even smaller with a couple techniques, um, namely looking at better hashing functions. For example, this is a simple experiment with the TensorFlow built-in hashing function. We can look at other um, maybe more efficient independent data independent hashing functions or even data dependent hashing functions that fit better to our actual distribution of um, categorical variables. And another cool technique we rely on is double hashing, where you essentially just add another hash table. And in order for a collision to happen, you have to have a collision across both. So in summary, um, we observed model drift. We fixed it by this stateful retraining, stateless retraining technique. Um, we noticed it's very expensive. We're going to do stateless retraining, off policy evaluation, progressive validation, and here's what we finally got for all of that hard work. Um, we experienced um, a pretty good performance increase here with the daily um, cadence, which is about 20% PTR increase over our, um, our baseline. And more importantly, um, I think the training costs decreased by 45 times which lowered our total costs in terms of money going to the public cloud by 45, which materially for Grubhub was hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So um, in conclusion, um, this is an interesting technique, I think, to take your um, supervised policy that's trained offline and to have it go online with a nice little simple analogy for um, fine-tuning and pre-training. And that's it. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I don't see a microphone in the room, but if you do have a question, I think you can probably come up and ask it. We are getting questions uh, online as well. Okay. Uh, so Gabriel Moreira uh, asks, have you used any specific techniques for incremental training, or do you use very different training hyperparameters? Uh, for example, lower learning rates. Yeah, uh, it's mostly, uh, a seamless swap unless you're using more interesting techniques. For example, before I explored this, I was using these um, decaying um, learning rate schedules across all of my epochs. Um, you know, but what is convergence when you're learning online? The whole notion is kind of blurred. So I had to kind of abandon that technique and go to more of a traditional just um, atom-based optimizer with a, you know, a, a learning rate that's not scheduled over all the epochs. Um, other considerations like the embeddings uh, make you have to do little types of adaptations. Uh, but otherwise, it's a, I, I think um, the beauty of it is it's a pretty simple, pretty simple swap to make it go online as long as you have a model architecture that supports updating incrementally. And that leads to discussion about you know, decision trees, for example. Are those updated incrementally? Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have one very simple uh, vocabulary question. Mm -hmm. uh, what's a PTR? Oh, um, that's purchase through rate, which is the, um, the order, or order rate, essentially, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Order conversion rate, yeah. Yes, we have a question. Uh, in the room. Thank you. Um, it's very, very interesting to see like the incremental training. I think for many practitioners, this is like the very nice thing to achieve. Uh, but did you analyze anything on the forgetting of uh, of your model? Because I mean, if you train on like a large data set, like you're pretty sure you won't forget sort of the first first data that comes, sort of comes in into that pipeline. But if you only train on the last day, mm -hmm. uh, you will have the fear of sort of missing out of yeah. the first, like on, on your Monday in your uh, scheme. Yeah, yeah, great question. I think you're probably talking about catastrophic forgetting um, with neural networks. And if I'm using this analogy of um, pre-training and fine-tuning, then I think catastrophic forgetting isn't a problem, it's a feature, it causes it to work. Um, being able to adapt to the new data rapidly is actually beneficial, I would argue. Okay, yeah, one more question from the room. <coughs> um, so I was kind of surprised by the big difference between daily retraining and weekly retraining. Do you have an explanation for that? 
why are we surprised? Uh, well, it, was, it was such a big difference, you know, where we would expect that if you do weekly updates, then still the model would be improving. And I think it was between 2% to 20%, I think, improvement, right? Yeah, um, I guess it just depends on the, the situation. Um, I, I, I don't have a, uh, an interesting answer for that. Um, yeah, and your mileage may vary probably. Okay, yeah. thanks. All right, we still have some questions coming in online, so, uh, so please sure. do check them out later. But I okay. think we have to move on to the next speaker now. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks.